I first started thinking about sustainability as an undergraduate at Stanford. We had just been accepted into the Department of Energy's Solar Decathlon, a two-year competition in which 20 collegiate teams from all around the world design and build net zero solar powered homes. And I was trying to figure out how to juggle being project manager of 100 students, convincing President Hennessy to let said students build a house on campus, building said house on campus without it falling apart, then breaking it apart to ship on trucks to Southern California, all the while maintaining a good GPA, making the most of the Stanford experience, finding a girlfriend, calling my mom every week, and getting enough sleep. This was a problem of sustainability. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, I gave up on that definition and instead focused all of my time on the sustainability of the house, namely its net zero performance. That means that it produces more energy than it consumes, and while net zero doesn't account for the full life cycle energy of a building, it's not a bad way to start thinking about sustainable buildings. As a designer, what I like best is that it's a two-way approach, meaning not only did we engineer a photovoltaic system to produce electricity, but more importantly, we reduced that electricity consumption to begin with through a combination of a tight building envelope, passive lighting and ventilation strategies, energy efficient appliances, and apps and switches that encouraged environmentally conscious behavior. What tied the whole project together was a vision of how to create sustainable homes like ours at an industry scale. We designed a core which integrated all the major complex systems of a home into a compact module, which could then be mass manufactured in a factory setting to reduce construction time and error, then shipped on the back of a truck all over the country and placed directly on a construction site with the solar equipment, HVAC systems, and appliances pre-installed, at which point it's up to the homeowner to customize the architecture around that core to their local needs. This is what the core looked like in our specific house from the outside, from the bathroom inside, and from the main living space. We actually did pretty well in the competition. We ended up winning first place in affordability and fifth place overall. Thank you. But the greatest reward was actually bringing the house back to Stanford after the competition and installing it permanently at the Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve, where currently the park ranger and his family are happily living inside and where it will remain a residence for visiting researchers for decades to come. So I thought that story was over, but as I took a gap year traveling abroad, I began to develop a more global definition of sustainability. Basically, that there are seven billion people sharing one Earth, and we simply can't exceed that planet's biocapacity. The problem is we're exceeding it by a lot, and guess who's most responsible? This map shows nations weighted by their energy consumption. And as you can see, countries like ours that have industrialized on fossil fuel economies have consequently developed unsustainable consumption patterns from the cars we drive to the homes we live in. But what scares me the most are not the oversized countries. It's the undersized ones with room to grow. Exploding economies like China, India, the Middle East, Africa, South America, where as GDP rises, billions of new middle class families are gonna be looking to consume the way we do in the States. And that's only gonna exacerbate our sustainability problem exponentially. So what can we do? Well, in the solar decathlon, I think we focused on too specific of a target market, namely iPhone toting, Tesla touting, eco-conscious US families that have 200 bucks a square foot to burn and access to utilities. And the hope was that energy efficiency would trickle slowly down into the US mass market. But now we realize that just as important, if not more important, is to focus on getting sustainability right from the get-go in developing countries, empowering billions of people with energy and opportunity while making sure that they don't make the same mistakes politically, economically, and socially that we did. So I'm really excited to announce that some of my team is now working on re-engineering the core for urban slums that have no access to electricity or sanitary systems. The greatest challenge is actually getting the cost of the core from 50K down to less than 5K, while adding battery storage, rainwater collection, and a composting toilet. But we also have to keep in mind that sustainability extends well beyond the energy efficiency of homes and includes civic engagement, good governance, jobs, education, all aspects of well-being. So I'm looking to partner with organizations like UNICEF and Ashoka that can engage local communities and come up with participatory solutions that have real social impact. See, providing these basic rights and services for the whole world is one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. But how sustainably we do that will determine our fate for centuries to come. 
So now when I think about sustainability, I see it as a call to action. Imagine if none of us had graduated from Stanford with individual degrees, but rather with commitments to long-term global problems, a commitment to health or equality or protection of the environment. And I think if each of us looked at our own careers and saw what commitments we already share, we'd find that by connecting with each other and leveraging this network, the Stanford alumni community alone could lead the world in solving the ultimate problem of global sustainability. And that's a vision I'm really excited about. So I'll conclude by inviting you all to connect with my commitment to sustainability. I'd love to talk more about it with you all later today. Thank you.